Hello and welcome to Our Voices. I'm Oriane Itangi Shaka. And I'm Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick. And I'm Ayan Bior. And today, Salem Solomon is sitting in for Hadiza Kiari. Welcome. Great to be here among my colleagues. When it comes to security and peacekeeping on the African continent, women are often portrayed as victims who need to be protected. But the story that hasn't been told is that from independence movements to modern militaries, women haven't been on the sidelines. They've been on the front lines. Today, we're going to look at military professionals who broke barriers and are paving the way for a new generation of young women who want to serve their countries and provide a safer future. But women serving in the military aren't just breaking new ground, they're also upholding an old tradition. Here's a look at what women in the military have already accomplished and how today's women are pushing for more representation in the highest ranks of the armed forces. Women have always played a role in African peace and security. This tradition dates back to at least the 17th century when the women warriors of Dahomey Modern-day Benin defended their kingdom against invaders, winning battles and inspiring fear. Women were also integral in Africa's liberation struggles. In Eritrea, during the country's 30-year struggle for independence, women fought alongside men and led groups into combat. They healed the wounded in the underground hospitals and helped repair equipment to return it to the battlefield. Today, women are striving to carve out a place for themselves at all levels of the continent's militaries. In South Africa, where the country has instituted gender mainstreaming policies, women make up 24 percent of the full-time active duty armed forces. Several African countries, including South Africa, now have female ministers of defense. Within the last two years, Kenya and Uganda each promoted their first female general in the armed forces. La valeur the value of a country depends on the value of its army. But in order to get back security, we need that our defense forces are restructured to defend the constitution and serve the people. We have a military with a minister of defense at the head who's a woman. I think that speaks volumes about the potential for cooperation between the United States and the Central African Republic. Women have also ascended to the highest ranks. We have uh, doctors, we have uh, engineers, we have lawyers, we have a jet pilot, we have uh, pilots in air defense. We have been able to be deployed in various phases of operations in the military at the tactical level, operational level. We are spoiled for choice, so uh, this is just the beginning. But difficulties remain. According to a study of South Africa's integration of women into the military, female soldiers are still pushed into lower profile roles. They are also sexualized and demeaned by male counterparts. As you have heard, roles of women have in some cases been diminished by history, as you also have heard, uh, have proven that men and women have actually um, not only managed a political system, but also controlled military institutions together. And in some mm -hmm. cases, women actually le led the, um, the fight, and it was okay. I mean, we've seen the example of uh, the, the homies of Amazon, of Benin, which were a actually a company of 6,000 women who actually were well-trained in the 1800s to fight against the French. We also have an example of Angola, the Queen Nzinga, whose military tactics are very well documented. We have also Ya Asantua of Ghana, who was very, very hardcore. I mean, she led a military force of 5,000 men to fight against the British. I mean, that's incredible. And don't forget about Queen Amina in Nigeria. At one point, she had 20,000 men under her command. That's exactly right. I mean, women have proven that they can go all the way up to the highest ranking of the military and also deliver great results. I mean, I mean, historian and uh, black historian Henry Clark notes in his writing that Africans have always had a way in life where men were secure enough to let women advance as far as their talents could take them. And so we know that women can actually deliver. Right. I mean, the question is, what is life like as a woman in the military? And I'm excited that today we have one of our own who has actually been in the military. Salam, can you tell us a little bit about 
how you were in the military, how you enlisted. Well, in my home country, Eritrea, you know, conscription is by design the way it is. And so what that means is that uh, women and men who are, uh, they have to serve mandatory 18-month uh, national service between the ages of 18 and 50. And so uh, that's how I ended up in the military and uh, as a young woman. And, you know, as it is right now, the indefinite national ser service has really been a problem for Western governments and other rights groups really portrayed as indefinite. Uh, but when it started, it started geared toward emancipation of women, mm. uh, empowering women in the right uh, for struggle for independence, but also in the struggle for uh, including in the front lines. Mm. And that's how it started. And you write about this so beautifully in your New York Times Magazine article. And the line that really caught my attention is when you wrote, every day before dawn, we marched in plastic sandals, sometimes stopping to pull inch-long acacia thorns out of our feet. We learned how to fire AK-47s and handle grenades. How did this experience change you? Well, that's a deep philosophical <laughs> question, I guess. But, you know, it really uh, made me really understand that I don't take anything for granted in my life. But also it was a defining moment for me because, uh, you know, it was uh, physically testing and we had to endure. Uh, we were taught to survive, basically. We were taught we had to endure temperatures of 100 degrees. Uh, we had to, uh, you know, go through dust storms and, and, and our endurance was tested on a daily basis. But I want to also mention, I don't want to over-exaggerate my military experience because I went through just basic training. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be unfair for the women who paved the way for independence struggle because they were seriously tested in combat, in the trenches, mm -hmm. in the front lines, alongside men and fought. And we're not talking about foot soldiers. Mm -hmm. We're talking about canned, uh, tank commanders. Mm -hmm. We're talking about women who were commanders who led men to war uh, mm -hmm. during a uh, struggle for independence. And one tidbit that is very interesting about the women from my country, they're pioneers in terms of combat. Mm -hmm. So 30% of uh, w w w fighters who gu guaranteed freedom were women mm -hmm. in my home country, Eritrea. Well, That's let me just preface what I'm going to say with I have a very healthy amount of respect and fear um, <laughs> for you now. I think we all do. Yeah, <laughs> she has shot AK-47. We're talking about women um, freedom fighters. You know, I I've been reading about the experiences of South African women uh, in the um, ANC, which is Africa's oldest liberation movement, in the mm -hmm. ANC's military wing, which was called Unconto e Sizwe, and that's a closer term for Spear of the Nation. Mm -hmm. And when the liberation movement decided to uh, launch an armed struggle against the apartheid regime, the women who were essentially guerrilla fighters spoke about how they had to fight a battle on two fronts. They had to fight apartheid, but they also had to fight for equality inside Umkonto e Sizwe. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, your experience is much more inside a conventional military. But when we talk about fighting for equality, what does equality look yeah. like inside the military? You still hear anecdotes of women, even generals, mm -hmm. uh, who say that it's very hard to climb up the ladder of higher off officer uh, positions. So that's, a, that's what you get when, when you have patriarchies mm -hmm. that prevent them and so it bleeds into military as well that's that's part of the reason why you, you get uh, you know people women saying that it's very difficult to climb up. well listen bullets don't discriminate and neither do explosive devices I mean when a bomb goes off it doesn't just target the male soldiers it hurts anyone right. in its path so just from purely a survival standpoint women need to be and can be just as ready as the men right. well ladies this conversation is just getting started and we want to get you talking on social media catch us on Facebook Twitter and Instagram Search for our handle at VOA Our Voices. We've got videos and updates. Be sure to share our pages with your friends. And also, don't forget to use the hashtag VOA Our Voices. We are also on WhatsApp. Just reminding you, send your videos, your messages. Our, our number is US country code plus one three zero four five zero six three six three eight. So reach out to us and add your voice to this conversation. And of course, I know we always say this, but we mean it. You are the fifth person on this panel, and now it's time for your voices to be heard. Here's what some of you have to say. We'll be right back. A lot of people have that misconception that the military is, when you don't have anything else to do, join the military. And that wasn't it. It's, actually, it's an actual profession. And so I wanted to actually show them that I've been accepted and this is what I want to do as opposed to involving them in the planning stage where they would have their own doubts and stuff like that. So I went and broke the news to them. My dad, he wasn't, 
he wanted me to go to pharmacy school or medical school and stuff like that. And he felt this, this probably wasn't his very happy moment. But that has long changed because he's very proud of the woman that I've become and the military woman that I've become. There are females out there who have proven to be uh, mentally, physically, and morally capable of uh, entering in the military service. But still they are uh, challenged by culture because our culture depicts a woman as being fragile, as being weak. But recently, uh, because you know, there are many professions that were restricted to women, but now women are embracing these professions. In the Nigerian military, women get some opportunities with the men. No, no, it's not possible. Over the years, history shows that even our ladies have not attained certain heights in the military. And uh, I don't think there has been a military chief of staff, army staff, chief of naval staff, chief of air staff, or chief of defense staff. They get to a certain height and they are retired. Even it was recently under Good Luck Jonathan that they were given the opportunity to attend the Nigerian Defense Academy to become officers of the Nigerian Army. Before now, no, it's not possible. I'll give an example of uh, Zimbabwe, which is my country, where we only have one brigadier general out of uh, I don't know how many other brigadier generals. And when you look at the ranking, she is on the seventh level, and that is when you start finding a female. In Zimbabwe, we do have a university. For, for defense, but when you look at the statistics of women that are enrolled, it's probably maybe 20%. As such, it's difficult for the women or the females to progress into decision-making uh, positions. Nowadays, like, each country needs uh, like an army to protect it. And if you look at the ratio between men and women, it's like 10 to, to 2, if I'm not right with the current statistics. So it means we have more women living on earth than men so and we've seen like we've had we've have uh, we've had women trying to fight for their rights and also trying to measure their uh, equality with men so i think they should be given a chance because it's something that has worked before Voices. We're talking about the news and issues you're talking about. Sharing stories of development and growth across Africa, around the world and in our lives. Topics that inform, empower and change the rules. It's time for Our Voices with me, Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick. And Hadiza Kiari. And Ayan Bior. And Orion Itangi Shaka. Join us on Facebook at VOA Our Voices. It's time for Our Voices. Like Voice of America on Facebook. Follow VOA on Twitter. Join VOA on our YouTube channel. Like, follow, join VOA. With our voices, welcome back. On the continent, as elsewhere in the world, in recent years, numbers of female troops being deployed in nations recovering from conflicts have improved. Let's take a look at some of the efforts being made. Peacekeeping operations require much more than brute force. They call for winning people's trust and working closely with the most vulnerable in times of war or fragile peace. More than ever, women are signing up to serve as United Nations peacekeepers. Roughly 8,000 are deployed in 14 United Nations missions around the world. The first all-female battalion was dispatched in 2007 to Liberia by the Indian government to assist the West African nation in maintaining peace and security. The women peacekeepers served for nine years, departing in 2016. Then President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf said they left a lasting legacy in Liberia. To inspiring Liberian women, to encourage them to join those entities, those operations that protect the nation. For that we'll always be grateful. Female peacekeepers play a crucial role in conflict areas empowering women civilians to make their voices heard, including during peace process. 
I like it most when we interact with them and we, we, we encourage them, we sensitize them, we create awareness for them to know their rights and they are like, we didn't know this, then they become happy that they also have rights to vote, rights to talk, rights to exercise, everything that they are supposed to. The United Nation also says that female peacekeepers can assist victims of sexual assault and shield children from violence in ways that male soldiers cannot. In many cultures, female peacekeepers are needed just to speak to female civilians since having an unknown male do so would be considered highly offensive. Despite their value, women account for just 5% of all peacekeepers. The United Nation is committed to achieving gender parity by 2030, says Bintu Keta, the organization's Assistant Secretary General for Peacekeeping Operations. Most of the women wearing those blue helmets come from the African continent, primarily Ethiopia, Ghana, Senegal, Rwanda, and South Africa. Keita also says recruiting and retaining women in the field, including those in uniform, is an operational imperative. You know, women's role as peacekeepers is just so critical. I was reading this article by Lindy Heineken, an anthropologist from the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa. It really resonated with me. It talks about gender integration in African military culture and how women talk about this great emphasis on uh, militarized masculinity and, you know, some women saying they felt that their femininity inside the military is being suppressed um, and that their feminine traits like being compassionate you know, conciliatory and peace-loving, that those traits are not valued and they're not promoted because it runs counter to this culture of dominance and aggression. And all of that's really in what is what embodies the military for so many women. And I wonder, for women to play a greater role in the military, do women have to change or does the institution itself have to change? Well, I think that the institution is the problem and I don't think that we'll make progress as quickly or as effectively as we can unless the institution changes. The fight for South Sudan's independence was led by the Sudan People's Liberation Army. But what people don't know is that there was a women's contingency attached to it. It was called the Katiba Banat, which means women's battalion in Arabic. And they were armed, but they were not involved in combat. And what they realized is that being a woman was strategic. It was an advantage because women are not seen as threatening as men. And so that made them great candidates for reconnaissance because they could go into towns and villages and collect intel. How many people are there? Mm -hmm. Are they pro or anti SPLA? Mm -hmm. And that intel was used by the SPLA to advance. But it's important to note that they were able to do this, not despite the fact that they were women, but because but the they were women. Being Ab women. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. And I, and I think that the institutions need to change to reflect that more women in the military can help militaries be better. That's but right. I would say that, you know, what needs to change is the mindset. And so what that means is that who's to say that men cannot be compassionate? Who's to say that men not can feel the way that women feel? I feel like the premise is flawed because you have to give opportunity so that people could could move up based on merit. So open it up for both men and women, and then you could see the chances. And also, if you think about it, who's to also say that women cannot uh, be aggressive if the environment of oppression uh, is uh, you know, on, on them? So you have to think about the rightful aggression in times of oppression, and we are very familiar with this. Not just, it's not unique to the military. I mean, that's, that's the conversation we need to have, is the mindset change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, I've survived the war in Burundi in the early 90s. In fact, I lived in a neighborhood where military forces as well as the rebels were at it every night, bombs, grenades, everything for many months. And I mean, the ethnic tension was so deep, you can cut it with the knife. I mean, there's community now that are healing through um, the peace process, uh, the dialogues and rebuilding their homes, rebuilding the different infrastructures that were um, demolished during the wars. Uh, a few weeks ago, actually about a week ago, I interviewed um, in a talk show a woman named Christine Hayes. She's a veteran journalist who back in the days, um, she have testimonies about, even put it in a book, that women tried so hard to bring the communities together that were torn apart mm -hmm. by actually forming a soccer team. What they would do is they would play soccer in their African raps. And it was wow. so funny that the neighborhoods <laughs> would just laugh about it. They would come together and they'll call them crazy women. But this was a way for them to actually unite communities that were torn apart because of ethnicity. And so we see the uniqueness of what women have to bring to the table. I mean, 
Amundsen says that it's increasing uh, its number of women uh, in their troops that are um, on the ground in Somalia. They say that uh, about 10—they went from 10 to about 700 in the past 10 years. I want to see a country like Burundi, who's the uh, second largest contingent in Somalia, increase their number of women, because they have a unique skill that they bring to the table. I mean, it's, it's really amazing what they can do and have bring their own skills that's not really conventional. And that soccer scene really speaks to you about, you know, it's not just about what happens inside the military, but also how the military is perceived by others, by us, you know, civilians. And I think if we want peace in more places uh, on the continent, our approach to security and peacekeeping is going to have to change. It is going to have to be more conciliatory and have a more people-centric approach, especially, you know, um, where civilians often find themselves in the battle sphere. We need military, a military and peacekeepers that value human skills as much as they value shooting skills. Mm -hmm. I think th that is important because, look, the way war is waged has changed. Tactics have changed. Armies have changed. They've had to, to integrate people based on race, to integrate people based on tribe. So I think women can really help transform the face of the military for the sake of women, if for no one else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's remained constant in the changing sphere of the military and other industries is that women who even fought alongside men who picked up the gun with, with them, died with them, sacrificed their lives, mm -hmm. when peace comes and after liberation, they are not guaranteed seats on, uh, in the presidency, they're not uh -huh. guaranteed seats in parliament. And so you see, even in my home country sometimes, women who fought, sacrificed their lives you know, cleaning the streets of the, the mm, capital city wow. instead of actually really being um, part of... They don't share in the spoils of war. Some things do stay the same, right? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. There's actually a joke in South Sudan that if you want a spot in the transitional government, you should just declare a rebel movement <laughs> and you'll get one just wow. so they can keep you quiet. Wow. And they have quota systems for that reason in South Sudan, in, in my home country, in Somalia, where traditionally the male, um, dom male dominates the parliament. And so they have to have quota system so that Just women equally mm -hmm. represented Correct. in their government. Uh, yeah, it's very interesting you mentioned about the quota system that they have to go through when we know very well that there are peacekeeping forces that are actually committing atrocities to the women in the communities that they're going to serve and bring the peace. So I think that, as I said, when women are put into this situation where they are coming into a country, especially like Somalia, whose culture um, prefers that women and women interact with each other, we can see the, the numbers go down with these kind of um, sexual violences that we've been seeing lately. Yeah, and conflicts are incredibly traumatic. And, you know, we think of South Sudan. The UN just released a report this week that says that sexual violence in the northern part of South Sudan is rampant. So think about the women there. They need female peacekeepers because only female peacekeepers can make sure um, that because only female peacekeepers serve as great role models and they are also able to talk to these women in ways that right. men just cannot. Yeah. I agree, Ayan. After the break, we'll introduce you to some women to watch who are redefining the roles in the armed forces and we'll be asking your opinion on women in the military. We'll be right back in a moment. This is a country that I chose to become a citizen. I didn't have to become a citizen. I chose to become a citizen. I feel like America gave me an opportunity to pursue my passion as an artist. I really believe that clean eating is, is a way to a more successful life or, or a happier life, if, if you want to put it that way. One of the things that helps me wake up every morning is doing better, being better. We grew up poor. And so I'm always focused on helping the working class be able to have a more comfortable lifestyle. I'm passionate about doing justice every day. Um, I oftentimes say that justice is a verb, not a noun. You know, I believe in action and moving the ball forward.
Welcome back. In case you haven't noticed, every day African women are doing extraordinary things. And here on Our Voices, we're putting the spotlight on their accomplishments in a segment we call Women to Watch. Today we're watching Lieutenant General Proskovia Leueso, the highest ranking female officer in the Ugandan army. After 37 years in the military, Leueso was promoted to the rank of Lieutenant General just three weeks ago. In her early days as a guerrilla fighter, she played a key role in the liberation movement called NRA as the first commander of the female wing of that movement. At 64, she's one of a handful of female three-star generals on the continent. We're also keeping an eye on a former liberation fighter, Dr. Lainesh Gebrahiwit. Dr. Lainesh practiced medicine in the most challenging of circumstances. She joined the Eritrean People's Liberation Front, the armed group that spent more than two decades fighting for Eritrea's independence. In the midst of Eritrea's 30-year struggle for sovereignty, she performed reconstructive facial surgery in underground hospitals protected from enemy fire. The conditions were harsh, with surgeries often performed without anesthetics. She is now in her 60s, but during the struggle for independence, Dr. Linish helped countless freedom fighters heal from traumatic injuries. Who do you think deserves a shout out? Use the hashtag VOARVoices and tell us who you think is a woman to watch. Be sure to look for our voices on the VOA website where you can find the world's top news stories. And we leave you with a quote from Bintu Keita of Guinea. The UN's Assistant Secretary General for Peacekeeping Operations said, the UN is committed to achieving gender parity by 2030. Bintu Keita used her voice to say, women peacekeepers act as role models in the local environment, inspiring women and girls in often male-dominated societies to push for their own rights and for participation in peace processes. And that is our show for this week. Thank you so much for being with us. Salem Solomon, thank you for your service on our show today. <laughs> From all of us here at The Voice of America, we'll see you next time. Goodbye.